and yet another very lovely evening out there to all of you, my dearest friends. This will be the final video that I'm actually putting out of Ezekiel 44, that in which I actually review. I'm just going to have the audio play for 45 through 48. It's mainly talking about the sacrifices and the, the tribes and all of those, so it's pretty straightforward. But 44 will need just a little bit of commentary, not much actually, it's mostly reading for today's study, but just to answer a few of these questions. Then he brought me back the way of the gate of the outward sanctuary, which looketh toward the east. So it's the eastern gate right here, the outward sanctuary, so it's the outward gate which looketh toward the east, and it was shut. Then said the Lord unto me, This gate shall be shut, it shall not be opened, and no man shall enter in by it, because the Lord, the God of Israel, hath entered in by it, therefore it shall be shut. This gate will remain in the millennial reign, perpetually shut, because the Lord, now just catch this, because the Lord, the God of Israel, hath entered in by it. That means that Jesus enters in by it, and it is shut. Only he can have access to that gate. The prophet must have noted this as an important difference between the new sanctuary and the old, whether temple or tabernacle, in which the east gate stood always open. That the gate of the new temple was to be closed only on the six working days, Ewald mistakenly infers from Ezekiel 46, where he reads after the Septuagint, the outer instead of the inner court. And the reason why I'm giving so much emphasis to the fact that only the Lord passed through this is because of the very next verse. There's so much conjecture over who is this prince that it's talking about. Verse 3, it is for the prince, the prince, he shall sit in it to eat bread before the Lord. Talking about in the eastern gate. He shall enter in by the way of the porch of that gate and shall go out by the way of the same. So the prince is the Lord. Now keep in mind how Ezekiel, he has such a vague notion that God will walk among us in human flesh, as did all of the prophets back then. Even Isaiah with Emmanuel, meaning God with us, he only had a vague notion. It would be a very bizarre thought for them to think that the Lord God would walk among us. It wouldn't have been bizarre for Abraham, their father Abraham. It would not have been bizarre because Abraham seen him, talked to him, knew everything about him. And Jesus even said uh, that Abraham delighted to see my day and was glad in it. So, uh, yeah, they both kept records that they met one another. But anyway, there are many reasons why people do not believe that this prince is Christ. Many most believe that he's uh, David, that David is going to be this prince and the Lord's going to sit in the Holy of Holies. David's going to sit in the holy place and just something along those lines. They believe that it'll literally be David. But there are other reasons. From the prince's offering for himself a sin offering, because we're told that the prince, he participates in these sacrifices in Ezekiel 45. From the allusion to his sons, we're told about this prince having sons. And from what is recorded about his behavior in worship, how he worships the Lord, or at least he eats food before the Lord. But none of these statements concerning the prince forbids his identification with Messiah. All of these can be explained um, with Christ. All of these can. It would just be a very, um, a very unique and quite bizarre way of thinking about him, unless on the supposition that it was already understood Messiah should be a divine human personage. But before we move forward, I have to give my explanation as to why I still consider Messiah fitting the all of these three requirements right here. But with our knowledge of today, now we can apply them to back then. It does say that the prince, he participates in the sacrifices, even the blood sacrifices of the people. Let me be very clear, my dear friends. I do not believe that we are going to be partaking in these, these uh, ceremonies. I don't believe that we're, I don't think that we have to. After the Battle of Armageddon, there are going to be survivors left on the earth. 
And the very first people that are saved from all of this great calamity to come upon the world will be the Jews. And then all of Israel together, all of their remnant will have to come together. And there will be earthly beings that will still have flesh and blood, will not have flesh and blood at this time. No, I'm fully convinced that we'll all have glorified bodies. And um, the entire atmosphere of the earth is going to change. People are going to live a lot longer. They're going to be much, much healthier than they've ever been. We went, we went over some of this with our talk on uh, Gog and Magog, how that army is probably going to be an army of giants because everything's going to go back to the pre-flood days where we know that people are going to live a long, long time, just as in the days of Adam and Noah and um, all of these. So the, everything's going to get bigger. Everything, there may even be dinosaurs come back. I know that sounds very radical, but um, uh, halfway through the millennial reign, we may start seeing dinosaurs again. I know that sounds very bizarre, but anyway, Everything's going to be much, much bigger. But during this time, I believe that Christ participating with these sacrifices, I, it's, this is all just for remembrance. Even Chuck Misler, he, he says that. He says that these sacrifices, though Christ has made the one perfect sacrifice forever and all, all, all time, these sacrifices, just as in the days before Christ, all of these were just pointing to his ultimate sacrifice. No sacrifice of a bull can cleanse you from sin. None. They're all just pointing towards or pointing back to Christ. So I believe that Christ being the, the high priest, he will lead them through and make sure that they perform these sacrifices as they were always intended to be performed as a remembrance of what he did. But there's also talks about this, this prince giving gifts unto his sons. And, uh, well, well, Christ is called the everlasting father. It's just symbolic, symbolically speaking, like we're called the bride of Christ. I mean, if you haven't figured out that the Bible uses imagery like this, so it doesn't have to be in a literal sense, everyone. And from what is recorded about his behavior in worship, well, Jesus is called the son of God and the son of man. So it, it'll be the son of man part. And Jesus has to show the disciples how to pray. He says, when you pray, say, our father who art in heaven, he calls him father. He prays unto him. So, yeah, I would say that he does lead in worship of God because he is the son of God and the son of man. Then brought he me the way of the north gate before the house. So I'm assuming the inner north gate. Before the house, and I looked, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord, and I fell upon my face. And the Lord said unto me, Son of man, mark well, and behold, with thine eyes, and hear with thine ears, all that I say unto thee concerning all the ordinances of the house of the Lord, and all the laws thereof, and mark well the entering in of the house, with every going forth of the sanctuary. And thou shalt say to the rebellious, even to the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, O ye house of Israel, let it suffice you of all your abominations, in that ye have brought into my sanctuary strangers, uncircumcised in heart and uncircumcised in flesh, to be in my sanctuary, to pollute it, even my house, when ye offer my bread, the fat, and the blood, and they have broken my covenant because of all your abominations. And ye have not kept the charge of mine holy things, but ye have set keepers of my charge in my sanctuary for yourselves. Thus saith the Lord God, no stranger, uncircumcised in heart nor uncircumcised in flesh, shall enter into my sanctuary of any stranger that is among the children of Israel. And the Levites that are gone away far from me, when Israel went astray, which went astray away from me after their idols, they shall even bear their iniquity. Yet they shall be ministers in my sanctuary, having charge of the gates of the house, and ministering to the house. They shall slay the burnt offering and the sacrifice for the people, and they shall stand before them to minister unto them. Because they ministered unto them before their idols, and caused the house of Israel to fall into iniquity, therefore have I lifted up mine hand against them, saith the Lord God, and they shall bear their iniquity. And they shall not come near unto me to do the office of a priest unto me, nor to come near to any of my holy things in the most holy place. But they shall bear their shame and their abominations which they have committed. 
But I will make them keepers of the charge of the house for all the service thereof and for all that shall be done therein. But the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, that kept the charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me to minister unto me, and they shall stand before me to offer unto me the fat and the blood, saith the Lord God. They shall enter into my sanctuary, and they shall come near to my table to minister unto me. Now that, that's, that's the privilege that's being denied from these other descendants of these fallen Levites, it is well assumed. So apparently there's going to be these tables where men will be allowed to sit very close to the Lord. And I'm going to say this. Now, this is a high up presumption, and I may be totally wrong in it, but I do not even believe that many of us will be residing around the, um, the temple of that time or even all in Jerusalem. It says that we're made kings and priests unto God. Now, we may very well just be, because Jesus says, I give unto ye ruler, uh, rule over ten cities, some rule over five cities, some rule over two cities, or three, or four, or six, or seven, or eight, or nine. I mean, who knows? But I believe that we'll be dispersed. And I believe that this will be for the descendants of, the blood descendants, at least, of Abraham, the Jews, Israel. I believe that this will be for them. The earthly, even. I don't believe that this will be the glorified. I believe that this will be for the earthly people. And Jesus, he's going to take the, the uh, take over the seed of David and the seed of Moses. He's going to lead them in all these ways. And the seed of Aaron being their high priest at that time. So the Lord is going to lead them in all of this. They shall have linen bonnets upon their heads and shall have linen breeches upon their loins. They shall not gird themselves with, it, with anything that causeth sweat. And when they go forth into the the utter court, even unto the utter court to the people, they shall put off their garments, talking about the outer court, wherein they ministered, and lay them in the holy chambers, and they shall put on other garments, and they shall not sanctify the people with their garments. Neither shall they shave their heads, nor suffer their locks to grow long. They shall only pull their heads. Neither shall any priest drink wine when they enter into the inner court. Neither shall they take for their wives a widow, nor her that is put away, but they shall take maidens of the seed of the house of Israel, or a woman, or a widow that had a priest before. This is such great proof that all of these ceremonies, all of these priests will only be for the survivors, the earthly folk, after the battle of Armageddon. This is not for us. It is very likely that the sacrifices will only be performed by those still in their earthly bodies. There seems to be no need for the glorified beings of the church to partake in ceremonies of remembrance whenever that the act of Christ will always be in our minds in a glorified state for he puts his name in our foreheads. How can we forget? But notice also the rules for these priests and marrying, the, how they're going to be marrying at that time, there's no marriage among us in glorified states, for we are as the angels, neither given in marriage nor marrying. And they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and profane, and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean, talking about these priests. And in controversy, they shall stand in judgment, and they shall judge it according to my judgments, and they shall keep my laws and my statutes and all mine assemblies, and they shall hollow my Sabbaths. And they shall come at no dead person to defile themselves, but for father or for mother or for son or for daughter or for brother or for sister that hath had no husband, they may defile themselves. And after he is cleansed, they shall reckon unto him seven days. Keep this in mind, how there will be people in whom do defile themselves at the time of the millennial reign. We're told about in the eternal city, the new Jerusalem, there'll be nothing there that, that defiles. My friends, this is not the eternal state of things right here. It just shocks me that there are any of these scholarly commentators who would ever dare believe such. And in the day that he goeth into the sanctuary unto the inner court to minister in the sanctuary, he shall offer his sin offering, saith the Lord God. This is one of the places where they argued that this is this can't be Christ. Well, I don't believe that it's talking about Jesus right here. I don't believe that you can get that they're talking about the prince. We're already far removed from the subject of the prince. We've been talking about the Levites. So I believe this is more talking about the priest or the Levites right here. And it shall be unto them for an inheritance. I am their inheritance. And ye shall give them no possession in Israel, 
talking about the Levites, I am their possession. They shall eat the meat offering and the sin offering and the trespass offering and every dedicated thing in Israel shall be theirs. And the first of all the first fruits of all things and every oblation of all of every sort of your oblation shall be the priest. You shall also give unto the priest the first of your dough that he may cause the blessing to rest in thine house. The priest shall not eat of anything that is dead of itself or torn, whether it be fowl or beast. I'm going to close Ezekiel with this right here. The reasons why the millennial Jerusalem is not the new Jerusalem spoken of in Revelation 21 and 22. Number one, the millennial reign is mentioned in Revelation 20. The new heaven and new earth after the earth has fled away at the great white throne judgment at the end of Revelation 20. Revelation 21 begins by telling us of a new heaven and a new earth. Number two, the new Jerusalem comes from God, from heaven, not established on earth as the Jerusalem of Ezekiel. Number three, no blood, sinners, dead bodies, war, Satan, or anything that defiles will be part of the new Jerusalem. And we just went over how there will be uh, people in whom are defiled at that time during the millennial reign, how there will be sacrifices. So blood will be shed. There will be sinners there because we're told about how Egypt rebels against the Lord during those days in Zechariah. There will be dead bodies that will, uh, will have to be buried. Some will actually be kept up for a remembrance. And their worm dieth not upon them as a remembrance of what will happen to the enemies. There will be war. We know that war is going to happen. And Satan, he's going to be let loose at the end of the millennial reign. And none of these things are allowed in the eternal glorious city. Number four is probably the greatest distinction between the two cities. Ezekiel at the end, he focuses on the millennial temple of the Lord. And as I've already went over, that is for the earthly inhabitants at that time. We are not even partaking in the blood sacrifices. My friends, we're, we're going to be kings and priests scattered throughout the world. It will be for the Jews and the Israelites at that time to partake in those as a remembrance of what Christ did. But there is no temple in the new Jerusalem. Specifically told that in Revelation 21, 22, there is no temple. And all of Ezekiel is talking about the temple. There is no temple as God and the lamb are the temples of the eternal city. Number five, one can ascertain that there will be no sun or moon shining on the new Jerusalem as there's not even night there, which is the number six reason. There is no night in the new Jerusalem. Number seven, there is no mention of the great walls, pearly gates, or any of the outstanding dimensions outlining the eternal city of Revelation in Ezekiel's descriptions. One thing that you have to keep in mind when reading the Old Testament, and I've been fixated on the Old Testament, um, especially the major prophets as of the last few months, and I have learned that the Bible is a constant revealing throughout, constant revealing. There are so many things kept from these Old Testament prophets that were revealed unto um, through Jesus. And then um, Paul wrote about and then Peter and James and uh, uh, John specifically in the book of Revelation. But the Bible is a constant revealing throughout. The Old Testament prophets were only given knowledge of the millennial kingdom for the most, the vast most part as it concerned their kinsmen, the Israelites and the Jews. It would not be until their rejection of Israel's king, until they rejected Jesus, that the greater revelations concerning the whole world would then be revealed by the apostles of Christ, which go beyond the thousand-year reign into eternity, because it talks of the whole world and the fate of the whole world, not just of Israel. Do not mistake this millennial reign for the eternal city, my dear friends. That is all that I'd like to say on this. And uh, as I said, I thank you all for joining me in the book of Ezekiel. It is a fascinating work, is it not? And this will complete our studies on the major prophets. We're going to be getting into Paul's writings, just a few of them here and there. Uh, Philippians will probably be the first one. I believe that's my favorite writing of Paul's, at least at this very moment. But I do thank you all for joining me. And uh, enjoy the remainder of this audio. God of peace be with you. Amen.